firstly, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, so, first of all, uh, like it seems like AI is like a very interdisciplinary subject. Clearly, you mentioned a lot of like psychologists and like even like what I've read is like al algorithm, like generic algorithm and everything. I've been derived from like biology and everything. But it seems like AI has been a core to CS classes only, even in like universities. So like, how much of the internet, like, do you think like a, only a computer scientist who has only a CS background will actually excel in a subject like AI? And if not, then how much of an interdisciplinariness do you think it's required? Like taking one or two, like taking psych classes is good enough or like actually double majoring in psych and CS or like um, similar field will be a better idea? That's a good question. Uh, um, I think AI is a huge field. In fact, sometimes um, one subfield of AI and the kinds of words they use, the vocabulary they use, the kinds of techniques they use, and another subfield of AI, they, do, they have nothing in common except the high level umbrella philosophy. I remember going to AAAIs and HKIs where there will be eight parallel tracks and I may be interested in two or three of them and when I go to a different track, I will have no idea what is going on. So, yes, there is a psychology side to AI, but you don't have to study psychology in order to do AI. You can actually do AI starting from where you are, as long as you have some of the core elements of the field. And the core elements of field that come from computer science and also come from statistics and probability, right? And so, uh, as long as you have those two backgrounds in detail, uh, in depth, then I think you can start out. Moreover, if you have some other background, like suppose you had linguistics background, then you would be a perfect person to do natural language processing because there AI gets applied to text and lingu uh, various languages. On the other hand, if you had background in healthcare, then you can work on healthcare applications for AI. So basically what we need is if you are innovating on the core technology, then the basics are in computer science as well as in math. Uh, and if you are working on applications, then some of these ideas come together in context of a certain application. So yes, the field is extremely interdisciplinary, but the field is interdisciplinary more because it has applications to that some other field or because at some point they borrowed some elements from another field. For example, Markov decision processes, I said, I, I, right, that is a, a formalism that we use in reinforcement learning, but it actually came from the operations research community way back in the 60s. But now MDPs has been part of AI and we have incorporated it. So you need not have operations research way of looking at MDPs, you can learn MDPs right away in the AI uh, school, in the AI classes. Now your another point that you mentioned is that AI classes are core only for computer science. And I think that is a challenge and I think uh, AI needs to be taught to broader audience. I in IIT Delhi, for example, often find students outside computer science and teach them as much as I am able to given uh, the popularity of the class. And that is not only true for AI, I would say this should also be done for machine learning and maybe some of the other techniques that are developed. So more people get to know about it and they can start using it in their particular fields. Yeah, uh, so like um, question was, so IIT Delhi is like extremely known for his BTEC program, like one of the best institutes in the world. and um, and a lot more in India as well. Uh, but regarding masters and PhD, it's it's seen like um, at least from I'm I'm an undergrad student. Uh, but even uh, passing out like finishing B Tech, you think of like going abroad for masters and PhD, and not thinking so much about doing it back in IIT or like even in Indian institutes. Um, so like a, that is a challenge. I'm quite sure like the university feels as. Um, so what like are the possible solutions that, in your opinion, are like practical enough? to be implemented and why is this even psychology even there in the first place? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really interesting question. That's a question that has been very important for pretty much all IITs and all um, researchers in India or most researchers in India and computer science at least. I think if you think about it, um, we need a very strong, well-oiled uh, ecosystem to do research. There is so much that is going on all around you. And when you work on research, you are trying to innovate to a point where you develop something that nobody in the world knows about. And that is very hard to do for a beginning student. So therefore, you need to do it in conjunction with an advisor. And if you look at the, you know, maybe let's just go back 20 years, I am told that the whole computer science department would have funding for one person 
to travel to some top conference and present their work. So, we have started in a time where the, the journals would take you know 6 months to come to IIT and the journal papers would have been submitted you know 1, 1 and a half years earlier than that and then they finally get published and so we get to know about information about research maybe 2 years after the research has already been done. So, by the time we start thinking about how to innovate on top of it, those researchers have already gotten a head start and they are much ahead of us. So, two things happened, some of the best minds who used to do really exciting research you know in their PhD, when they moved back to India, they did not find the same amount of resources and information to be able to make significant inroads and slowly they start their research started to fail or reduce in uh, significance and impact. Some of us did succeed, some of the best successes that came out of India happened in theory because uh, in computer science because uh, theory does not require uh, lots of resources and moreover you can work on 30 year old problems and you can actually make impact and this is what happened with for example, Manindra Agarwal's prime in P the famous uh, theorem which was a 30 year old problem and he sort of cracked it sitting at IIT Kanpur with his undergrad students or right with the students in IIT. So, but that kind of research it is very hard to do a lot of it, it is very hard to crack 30 year old problems all the time. More often than not you do research because you get to know of a very interesting idea and you start to develop it like suppose neural networks just happened, you want to suddenly start using it and have. So, suppose when I start to use neural networks, now it is a very computation intensive uh, uh, model right. So, for that I need to buy resources and for that I need to find funding and this is not only true for me, it is also true for people in academia in the US and in England and elsewhere, but the speed at which I was able to find funding here was you know much less than the speed at which you know there they are able to find funding and find resources and move right. So, it is a fast, it, there is a fast movers advantage that happens. So, therefore, it becomes somewhat difficult to be a sort of the top leader, thought leader of a field sitting in India, because a lot of innovation is happening in the US. Things have changed to a drastic level now, where we have lots of funding for travel. We also have uh, uh, information that comes out very quickly like on archives, people even publish uh, is relatively less complete works and so we get to know what is happening in the world very quickly. So, now some of those challenges have gone away. Now, it is the onus is on the younger faculty to make use of this an opportunity and start doing high quality research and things are changing. Again as I said, you know, if you go back 10 years, there were very few researchers which were publishing at the top level. Now, we have 30 of those, I am sure 5 years down the line we will have 60 or you know something like that and things will improve. Students will only come once you have excellent faculty members who are publishing at the right level and who are doing impactful work. Students will stay later because it is not in their best interest to work with us in a system which is not the highest quality except if they have some other constraints. So, sometimes we get really awesome students, but those students have some secondary constraint to stay in India. Therefore, they come to us and you know that is our privilege that we are able to advise them and therefore, do really uh, good work through them. But that is not the solution. The solution will only happen when slowly this thing evolves and we have we are in a much better place with respect to our research. And this is going to happen, uh, the question is uh, in, how, in how much time. So, uh, my first question is uh, that when we talk about AI, so when it is uh, actually beating the humans in chess, so we know that a checkmate means the machine has won. But in case of open ended questions in finance or economics as we are looking for AI to solve. So, um, and especially when we do not know what it is actually used, what it is actually doing to give, give the output, how reliable or safer it is in uh, when it would be actually affecting the masses. Okay. So, uh, the question about safety is an interesting question and it is also a challenging question already. For example, uh, suppose I uh, the machine says you know why do not you do such a such procedure on the particular patient. If it does not have a strong safety model, if it can make mistakes, then that is going to be catastrophic. And we do not want AI systems to be catastrophic in making their choices and failing suddenly, right. And that is exactly what happened in the context of the self driving car that Tesla uh, had, where uh, the sorry, or Elon Musk had uh, with respect to Tesla. So, this person was raving about this car saving him, 
a week later, a week earlier. And then suddenly this car could not identify a huge white truck and uh, this person died. And uh, these kinds of mistakes are going to happen early on when the AI has not reached the real performance. Once it reaches the right performance, then the AI system will be much more accepted. But in the intermediate times, there is going to be some kind of back and forth where people will question whether the AI systems are good for the, uh, for the society at large or not. So, to answer your question, I think safety is an interesting and difficult topic. People are thinking about it. Uh, the bigger challenge is how do we know that something is safe? Well, we can put in constraints. We can add constraints uh, and figure out that and make sure that the machine is not going beyond that constraints. But to specify all possible constraints so that it stays within the realms of safety is actually by itself a hard question. And so I would say that research is still on in making sure that the AI system stays safe while delivering the value they have to deliver. Uh, so, uh, the next uh, question that I want to ask is like as um, while taking pursuing a career as a uh, researcher or a scientist when we actually do not want to just stick towards our books or something like that, how hobbies can play a role in uh, actually developing our thought process as a researcher? Interesting. So, it is not usual that somebody asks about hobbies in a technical talk, but I think that is a really good question. It is my firm belief that everyone, every productive person should have a balance of uh, uh, three things. One is uh, they should have some intellectual activity that they are part of and in our world in the computer science world AI or whatever research that we are doing which is technical already uh, has uh, intellectual implications we are constantly using our brain to um, solve our problem. So, that is easy for us, but some people may, may or may not doing that, be doing it. The second thing we should be doing is we should always be doing some physical activity that keeps our body healthy, that keeps our mind fresh, that gives us a way to you know take time off uh, 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 our day to day activity and sort of give us um, uh, energy and keep us fit. And I think the third uh, very important thing is that we should be uh, engaged in some kind of aesthetic activity maybe mere painting, maybe drawing, uh, uh, maybe music, maybe dance, maybe theatre, anything that sort of develops our sense a fine sense of uh, a fine sense of sense of uh, beauty and aesthetics. And I feel that once we are, now I want to mention that it is very hard to find balance in all three of these. For example, I have seen exactly two people in my life, which I would say are excellent at something in all three of these. You know, excellent at playing something, excellent at performing something or do, um, doing something artistic and excellent at something intellectual. I have found three or two such people. So, it is a very hard balance to find, but it is I think a balance that we all need to work towards because if our mind is fit, if our body is if my body is fit, if our mind is fresh, then we can do more, we can do better intellectual research. We can start to see beauty in our research, you know every once in a while you see these people who would you know jump off and say yeah I have solved this problem and get really excited or see a proof and they say this is the proof that you know God must have written and therefore it should be part of the book. I hope you know I am talking about Paul Erdish. So, once we start seeing beauty in science, when we start uh, connecting all these then we become passionate about what we are doing and that sort of makes us a wholesome person. I do not know whether that directly affects our research, but I do feel that indirectly it gives us a sense of balance. I have seen this in my work life once in a while where I am really tired, I do not want to do more work, but I have to do work, but I had two hours where I have to play music first and after playing music I feel like I have more energy to do work. So, sometimes some of the other activities gives us energy back to do something else where it may be draining. So, this balance really makes us uh, makes this wonderful. And I do not know uh, if a hobby directly affects research, but I think a balance in these three makes us a, you know, a wholesome person and I bet it will affect research indirectly as well. My first question being uh, like your PowerPoint slide said that you can use AI in a lot of fields like AI for education, AI for medical, health, etc. I was wondering why was not there any AI for environment as such because uh, that is where we live, this is the earth where we live in and 
I couldn't see any stress upon our environment and yeah, not in my slides for sure. But yes, AI can be used for environment whenever there is a lot of data being generated, and from that data I can do predictions. I uh, uh, AI can be used. So, for example, environmental predictions I can use AI using these environmental predictions to maybe figure out interventions. Maybe some simulations in the context of AI can help. So, definitely AI can help in environment to the best of. Oh, and it has it is being used. So, for example, there is a lot of work in a field called computational sustainability, where uh, AI techniques have been used to figure out bird migration patterns, figuring out what kind of interventions do we need to do so that birds start coming into a certain space and so on. Birds is one example, but many many different kinds of examples have been uh, uh, found in this context. And I would suggest so you look at uh, Cornell who university which has a very uh, significant institute of computational sustainability and they do a lot of research there and lots of other people in the country do research in this area. But I am less aware of that uh, work so therefore, I did not bring it up in my talk. All right, my second question being uh, also not usual and seen in technical talks. Uh, what, how, how important would you think are scientific interpersonal skills, communication skills? Like mostly students are bound to a book and a desk and a chair in classroom, but how would you think, uh, what do you think is the importance of that? A researcher is his own marketing person. This is, uh, the sooner you realize this, the better it is. I, this is my firm belief. I have to give talks, I have to write papers, I have to discuss with colleagues, I have to sell my work. We are really all the time marketing our work when we do research. Why? Because we have written the paper, we cannot just wait. You know, the number of papers that are coming out in the world are so many, we cannot just wait to hope that someone will pick it up and move beyond it. We, if we want to make a change in the world, if we want to make an impact to the world and we are often doing research because we want that, it, it is our responsibility if we have done something significant, if we believe we have done something salient to popularize it, to tell others, to tell them its implications, to help them find uh, collaborations. This is also true if you are not a researcher, if you are in a company, you still have to prove to your boss that you should be allowed to do what you want to do. You may have to give uh, uh, presentations in the company, you may have to work with your colleagues in the team and you may have to communicate with them all the time. So, interpersonal communication, technical as well as giving talks, as well as writing papers. These are all extremely important in the life of a researcher. And therefore, I think that we all should be developing these skills and there are many things and your advisor would obviously guide you in what kinds of skills you are lacking and how to improve them. I can tell you honestly, when I wrote my first paper, I was terrible in uh, writing papers and my advisor almost completely changed the uh, the paper. It was my organization, I was very good in organizing information, but I was really bad at language and communicating it. Over time I figured out how to say something which is in, in the right level of abstraction, at the right uh, tone and pitch and then over time I try to impart that to my students. So, it is a process, it takes time to learn, but I think it is extremely important. So, what type of skill set as a student that I need to get into AI? What type of skill set do you need to get into AI? Your excitement in AI and, uh, um, and math and computer science. Basically, those are the skills you would need. So, I think uh, when people do AI, they have to do a lot of linear algebra, at least in the modern world. They may have to do a lot of probability. They may have to do a little bit of logic. Uh, they may also have to do um, uh, some data understanding, some data processing and uh, they may have to innovate and build those uh, algorithms. So, you have to have strong computational background, strong programming background. So, I think those are the skills you need. Um, I do not think the skill set is uh, very unusual, but yes, there is one thing that sometimes bothers some people within AI. Sometimes our problems are very ill defined. We do not know exactly what does it mean to achieve AI. So, you know we have to somehow look at the domain of interest and think about what is the right formulation here, what is the right problem here and that takes some time and some learning and there is a little bit of uncertainty in there. And some people are more comfortable with well defined problems and sometimes AI does not give them. But other than that, I do not think there are any skills which are very particular to the field of AI that uh, 
that that is you know the the roadblock in somebody's entry into the field i think it's just basic math and computational skills sir my next question is uh, can we call ai as a new species because we are just taming it uh, past in past we just tamed a horse and uh, used it to for transportation and then we got into the mechanical car and then we are now getting into the intelligent car or i can say it as an uh, intelligent mechanical horse basically a new species uh, that is invented or discovered by in the nature by humans so is that it, that is my question like can we call it as a new species right so so the best analogy i give is that ai is the brain okay of any species right so uh, if i am talking about self driving cars then the the algorithm that figures out when to brake when to move the steering that is the ai but and it is operating inside an organism which organism the car itself right so i would call intelligent car maybe as a new species going by this analogy i wouldn't call ai itself as a new species ai is the brain that is powering all kinds of species so you may have a chess player that's a new species you may have a go player that's a new species you may have uh, a, a siri and cortana and they are species of their own the ai is what is powering their behavior so i wouldn't call ai as a species it's just an organ inside many many species so what are the technical advancements in uh, hardware design by ai like is ai contributing in hardware design also ai has always been contributing in hardware design so even when we used to teach uh, you know early on we would say that just a uh, vlsi design and figuring out where to place each particular transistor and you know diode and so on and so forth that is often optimized by ai so because ai can do optimization for you and you have you know a circuit that you want to put together on a chip how should you place it often people would use uh, algorithms like uh, simulated annealing which are part of ai so um, this is way back in 80s Uh, but if you ask me specific questions with respect to how ai is helping hardware design in the modern world i am not 100% sure i do know that there's a lot of work going on in gpus as you can understand uh, deep learning needs uh, high quality gpus so uh, google uh, came up with what is called a tpu uh, which where which you you can run a tensor flow on and tensor flow runs much faster then on a gpu and a lot of new hardware is are coming out a lot of new uh, uh, processing units are coming out by companies like nvidia and so on because they want to improve the performance of gpus but i am sure that there much more is going on in with respect to the use of ai in hardware uh, design but i am not aware of uh, all of that it's not a domain i have thought too much about so this question is per- pertains to general research but uh, i will uh, like you to answer in the context of ai in which it is more relevant as you said that ai has become much more buzzword and hype because it is entering the lives of the people and getting to the user each and every user so my question is uh, as a early researcher in ai uh, a lot of people get into the dilemma that whether they should contribute towards the technical novelty of the field or the societal impact and sometimes both the things don't go together if you go towards the societal impact as such you may not give something very new technical and you may lose early there and or the other side if you go towards the technical novelty you just drive the theoretical things forward and you leave the societal impact which is also not true and it is i think very relevant in the context of living sciences as well where we want that the science should enter to the society as such what do you think about this thing and how to resolve this dilemma for early researchers that's an excellent question and i think um so first of all i disagree with the point that uh technical innovation and societal impact don't go hand in hand i have often seen that some of the best innovations happen in the context of an application you can take object recognition and the use of cnns was all driven towards the object recognition data set you can take alpha go and the use of a specific way of doing reinforcement learning was all driven through the context of alpha go so i think once you are very passionate about an application then it back tells you i mean it sorry you can go back from it and it tells you what kind of technical innovation is needed in order to solve it at the same time if you have been thinking about this in the context of algorithms and context of current state of the technical world then you can see some holes 
you can see that okay this is not done this is not done and this is not done and I can do any of these three. There I think you can think a little bit about what would be more useful to the world, what will have more applications and then focus on that part of the technical question. And if you have been able to create something fundamental, then also there is some onus on you to show that some this fundamental thing has so many applications. So, I am personally very comfortable whether you go from applications to technical innovation or technical innovation to applications. I think the importance the important thing is to make sure that you close the loop so that you feel happy that you did something which is technically significant and has many applications and you also showed value in a particular application or two. Now, your point is still valid though as an early researcher where do you start from? You did not ask it like this, but this is the question one should be asking should I start from theory or should I start from application? And I think that answer is personal, I think it is a matter of who you are. So, research is your self expression, how you think, what you think is important, how you solve a problem all these things come together in your research output. So, if you are a kind of person who lives in the world of models and algorithms and you know uh, and, and loves solving puzzles and you know keeps thinking about them all the time, you will have some theoretical puzzles going on in your mind and that is what is pushing you, that is your passion you should start from there. If on the other hand you are the kind of person who is thinking how can I use this technology that I know my understanding in you know giving clean water to all the people or in reducing poverty or whatever is the question that you really stand for, then you start from there. At the end of the day you can start from an application go back and come up with the theoretical advancement or start from a theoretical advancement and make sure that you uh, improve the application. By only doing one and not doing the other that is the problem make sure that you start from somewhere, but you finally try to close as much of the loop as you are able to. So, in your talk you mentioned about war robots, so what are the implications of uh, using AI in war and uh, especially against nations like China who already has the means of production and they can outproduce anybody. So, I, I am not aware of uh, where China is with respect to their war robotics. Uh, the question is stands, question is valid, the question uh, leads a little bit of a difficult picture, uh, but I would point out that uh, that it is all about policy when it comes to war. So, think about uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons have the ability to completely devastate the whole of the earth and the only thing we can do as scientists is nothing you know nuclear weapons have been made. Now, what can uh, policy makers do? They can keep them safe. So, that is the first thing that we have to realize that when it comes to war policy plays a much stronger role than technology and often you know a lot of people say that technology by itself is value neutral, it is about how it gets used. Now, in the context of AI and war lots of things are going to be possible in the future. How much, when and where, what gets used? is the matter of policy as I just said. So, for example, uh, there may come a time where we do not want to send people to war, we want to sell robots. If we send robots to war, then there will be very little very few casualties, no casualties, but it may also decrease our threshold to go into war. So, so now that is a challenge and how we deal with it is completely up to us right. Another thing that could happen is that um, one could have targeted weapons. So, nuclear weapons will uh, or any kind of bombs weapon could the bullet could you know, the bullet may know where who it is supposed to hit. Now, I am just you know I am just sort of fantasizing here, but it is very much possible right. And if we have that kind of technology in the bullet it might may be good for uh, the mankind we will only kill Osama bin Laden and not kill anybody else around or whatever it is right that we are uh, thinking about. So, what kind of a future we would have? with war robotics is not very clear. I can tell you that a lot of AI researchers got together a couple of years back and signed a major letter requesting the government to not in, uh, study war robotics and so on and so forth, but really governments will not study that is not going to happen because uh, if some other government studies then you are late in the game. So, so we do not know exactly how it is going to turn up, it can actually be much better because people are not getting killed 
it can be much better because we are not killing lots of people at random. It could be much worse that we may go for more wars because uh, you know it's easier to go on wars now because we don't need to send people. So I don't know the clear future that it will have. It's a question that we are all thinking about in general. Uh, Mwazam, you have experience of working in US and India as a mentor. So one question comes to mind is what difference do you see among the student population? Um, especially I'm asking in reference to PhD students. So do you find any difference or? Uh I think students are students anywhere you go. But of course there are some statistical differences. So there will always be exceptions. There will always be people who are really good at something here or really good at something there or vice versa. Um, but also the statistical property of a student population is dependent upon which university you are in. So if you rank all the universities into one you know, large ranking and various organizations do that, then I was lucky to be at University of Washington which is sort of in the top 6 or 7 or maybe top 5. And now I am at IIT Delhi which is at uh, uh, say top 50 uh, in the best case currently. So uh, that naturally creates a certain student population. Right. And also because we are in India, uh, only Indian students come here. Right. So those two factors determine the difference in the student population. So for example, in, in US at University of Washington, the kind of students were so smart because they were the best from IITs, from single university, from you know, the top places all over the world that uh, their level of training was very strong. And uh, they were often taught by really, really uh, awesome teachers you know uh, and they had a uh, background on subjects you know I myself may not know about and so when those kinds of things happen then an idea can be converted into a, a technology or a working demonstration much more rapidly because they can move much faster because of their training. And moreover I have sometimes felt that at least uh, the average uh, American has more initiative than an average Indian. So, for example, in India, we are, you know, we emphasize rote learning, we emphasize uh, solving a problem correctly, but we never question the problem. We, there is no innovative solution, there is always one answer kind of a thing. And in that kind of a setting, and it is typically resource constrained uh, setting. So, in that kind of a setting, the, the students are somewhat more linear. Whereas, a student in the US, uh, in general, uh, they do many more presentations, they do build many more projects, they do team things. So, they are somewhat more dynamic at times than Indians. And so, because of that what ends up happening is that you know you start a conversation in a certain direction, the student may take it in a very different direction because of their sort of general awareness and uh, dynamism. So, I think those two things are somewhat missing here. So, you find that, uh, so the, the students that come here require a lot of training because many times they are from the tier 2, three, tier 3 institutions within the country and they have been taught from books and uh, uh, which sometimes may be older curriculum and the teachers may not always be excellent and but they were diamonds in the rough and so we judged them to be diamonds in the rough so we took them on and we started working with them. So the first year, two years of productivity is rather low because they are still trying to figure out the basics and taking the courses and trying to understand what is going on. That kind of delay may not happen in a top university like University of Washington, but it may also happen in let us say a uh, equivalently ranked university in the US. right? So there are smaller departments who may not always get the best of the students and there you may find that you may require the same level of effort with the student to train them. Moreover, because th these are Indians, their level of respect to you is very high. So you will always often tell them something, they may often do that thing without necessarily at least in the beginning thinking about that maybe the advisor said something which does not make sense. right? So that level of respect and that level of uh, I would say lack of questioning that is natural to our society that sometimes gets translated into the PhD students. So I often ask my PhD students to call me by my first name, I tell them that we are peers in research for the reason that literally when we do research advisor is guiding for sure, but the advisor does not know the answer either. It is not a teacher who knows the answer and wants you to figure it out. A, a, a PhD is a situation where both the advisor and the advisee are trying to find the answer together and so therefore they are most more often than not peers. And so as soon as the advisor, the advisee or the student starts to question the advisor, say that this does not make sense or believe that it does not make sense, do things on their own initiative, 
I start to feel much better for my student because now I know that they are taking ownership of the problem and trying to run with it in the direction that they believe strongly. So, I think those two differences are there. Uh, I would say that anything that I said here about lack of initiative is also true for some of the students there. Anything that I said here about maybe not the best students in terms of training is also true for some of the students in even a top university like University of Washington, but I think the proportions are different. One of the students asked the importance of communicating skill, uh, but seems like as an advisor you also have to have management skill and you know personal skill and managing people and projects. Uh, so how and how and when one should think of you know acquiring these skills and what can help because this is a mandatory something I mean a set of skills that you ought to know it before you know. You know we all learn it on the job. I do not have an MBA degree, uh, <coughs> it would be nice if I did, but you know. Um, so, so, I have a team of maybe 20 students right now, uh, not all PhD of course, and so one has to manage them all the time and there may be some interpersonal relationships uh, issues that may happen sometimes between the advisor and the student, sometimes between two students working together on the same project. There may be time uh, management skills that you need when you are working with so, diff so many different students and many different projects, then you have to make sure that you, you know. Uh, a portion as part of your time for teaching, a part of your time for each individual project and no project gets left behind and so on and so forth. So, yes a lot of management skills are needed uh, and this is I would say typically needed as you grow up the ladder in anything. For example, as a PhD student my only job was to solve my problem and maybe take a course and do the assignment once in a while, but mostly solve my problem and whatever is the next step for that. I had all the time in the world to do that one thing right. As I grew mature I started doing two problems on in parallel. As I became a faculty member I started with two students early on. Later when I started becoming comfortable I had three, four, five students. Now I have seven students and so many undergrads and so many different things going on in addition to a lot of my professional responsibilities. So, I think we all learn on the job. This is also true for a beginning engineer who is just doing coding to a team leader to somebody who is thinking designing for the team and so on and so forth. So, this kind of role and shift often happens for all of us. I think the best we can do is to you know, introspect a little bit and see if we are lacking in one particular direction uh, dimension then we work on improving it and also open communication. So, whoever you work with they have a model of you. There they are certain things that they like about you and then there are certain things that they do not like about you. To the extent you are able to have a slightly open conversation, it is hard to do it with students because you know it is a power relationship, but to the extent you can have an open communication channel it sort of gives you feedback in what you need to improve. But I do not have a magic answer for how to improve management skills. I think it happens on the job and some people ha are easier, uh, are better at it and some people are not always. But uh, so I agree you know you can learn on the job or I mean as you go along, but is there something um, if you have to go back in time and you can tell yourself not to do professionally speaking? I, I really can not think of one. I have had a fairly happy life so far. <coughs> professionally uh, uh, I have made some choices. I still if I had to make the same choices I would make the same choices based on the information I had. Uh, I was deciding between uh, a, a faculty job and a research career in, academia, in research center and I chose the faculty job. I am very happy I chose that. You know, there were several problems I worked on. There were some problems I failed on and somebody else solved them. And you know this is sort of part of the game, I, I cannot think of something off the top of my head. Maybe I should do more introspection. So, talking of choices, uh, you were a faculty in US University and you decided to come back and a lot of students want to know what is it that make people come back to India and when there are several reasons not to come back you know. So, so here, here there are two sides of the question, one is what was the reason I came back to India? And one is what are the reasons I would give now for coming back to India having lived and experienced what does it mean to be an academician in India. So, those are two different questions because my, my knowledge of how Indian academia works was relatively limited at the time. And so, uh, so the reason for me to come back to India was primarily personal. Uh, it was not really a professional decision, I was very happy professionally in the United States. But I think there are some very distinct advantages of being in an uh, in uh, a researcher in a country like India. Uh, first is the amount of impact you can have. We are training so many more students and 
every new PhD student who we graduate in US has some impact, but every new PhD student we will graduate in India will have much more impact because the community is much smaller. So, the kind of impact, the kind of say we can have in the policy making, for example, so many times I get calls from uh, government of India for participating in uh, various meetings which will decide, decide sometimes the future of the country on a certain topic. And that kind of impact I can never even imagine I would have in United States where they are just the stalwarts and the masters of the craft all, all over, right. So, there is some advantage to being in a relatively small place and having a skill that is important. So, that is one advantage. Secondly, there are some very interesting advantages that happen because you are living in India and you have access to the problems that Indians face which they may not necessarily have sitting in the United States. So, there are many problems for developing countries and many, many technological problems, impactful applications that you could work on and touch lives of millions of people if you succeed which would be much harder to do sitting in the United States. So, there you are thinking about the first world problem sometimes, right, you know why does my city not recognize the thing correctly and you know does not give me the right joke or whatever it is. But here you can actually you know do something where the farming population will benefit and once the farming population will benefit given the, the agri agrarian society we are, you know it could impact you know millions and millions of people. And so, that kind of impact, broader societal impact is very uh, satisfying for a researcher and would be much easier to gain in India. Wow, with this positive note we will just end here. Thank you Mausam again. Thank you so much. Thank you.